Okay, so um, we believe, as Victor mentioned in his presentation before, that three D um, three D mesh maps would be the would change the the way we are looking at maps, using maps, and by them understanding the world around us. Um, and we have what we we want to show you today is the technology that we have developed to produce 3D meshes automatically and also um, the workflow that we have um, for using the 3D mesh and adds applications on top of it. So before we even talk about technology, let's give you a brief look on how a 3D mesh looks like. Um, we're going to open a three centimeter data. This is a very high resolution acquisition. This is from Vancouver, Canada that we'll look to see in a second. Uh, we mapped all of Vancouver. Vancouver is roughly 80 square kilometers, and this was done uh, in a three centimeters resolution. And we'll show you, we'll show you how a three centimeters data looks like. And if this is now, if you look now, you see a 2D view, right? This is a 2D view we all know. And I agree fully to what Victor mentioned. 2D is not just not enough anymore. It's just not enough for today's interactive world. It's not enough for people who want to see details, go inside, zoom in, rotate the images, view the images. So when you look inside the 3D map, and, you, and please pay, att pay attention to the small details that you can see, and the level of details that is possible to see in three centimeters, and this I'm talking about the full city scale mapping. This is not just drones collecting one or two square kilometers. I'm talking this Vancouver is 80 square kilometers, and we'll show you some more examples of other cities. Um, so this really changes the way we can um, handle data today. And there was some discussions before about how fast a 3D data can be delivered. So I think we can show you quite fast results using our, uh, our technology. Um, we'll see some more examples and applications in a second. So in Israel, we've done few cities, uh, roughly 10 cities just this year. Jerusalem in Israel, all of Jerusalem is 3D mapped. Um, Haifa, north of Israel. Acre, that's also in the north. Um, we did some quarries in two centimeters resolution with drones in the US, in Africa. And the city of Netanya, which is 20 minutes away from here all in 3D, all in three centimeters. This is just a short list of some of the projects we've done in the last year. Uh, we work globally. We work not only in Israel, we work in, in the US, in South America, in China, in Africa, um, using our technologies. So the, the 3D workflow, I want to work fast uh, over it with you, is for collection. So first, of in, first is collection, then processing, and then I will also refer to the term 3D GIS. So first, collection. So we are, very, we are fighting very hard to get the highest possible resolution because for us in the 3D mesh world, resolution is everything. Resolution is actually the king of, of the, the 3D workflow and it makes a whole lot of difference. So if maybe in 2D maps you wouldn't even pay attention if there is a difference between 3, 5 or even 7 centimeters, you would definitely see a difference when you're talking about 3D meshes. The, ch the difference between 3 centimeters and 10 is it's huge. And we will show you some example. Then the processing. Uh, processing, we actually, with this fully textured realistic option now to model, we actually reverse the order of manual and automatic uh, work. So now 90% of the work is done automatically, and maybe 10% is done manually, and not the other way around. And 3D GIS really means to add up added applications and integration of other layers on top of the 3D model. And distribute, distribute of the data is very important. That could be done either by local viewers or web distribution that we also do. Um, let me talk a, a second about our collection system because it is that quite unique. Um, so these are some of the leading oblique and 3D collection systems available today in the world. There are most of them using five, eight, or 10 fixed cameras. Um, all very large, quite expensive, require designated aircraft, usually with a shooting hatch, usually two engine aircraft that you cannot find anywhere. And our approach was different. We tried to take a different, uh, much simpler approach, as our name. And this is how our collection unit looks like. This is a phase one 100 megapixel camera. We rotate it from across track, um, but still we, we maintain the one to 500 scale mapping accuracy. Actually, this camera is approved by the Israeli uh, agency for mapping. 
And what's cool about this system, it is also its size, because this is a very small size system. I'm talking se seven kilograms and roughly the size of a football. So this can actually, we use it on light aircraft, but this is actually can be also used in the future on drones. Um, it's so small that it can even allow us to mount it in a, on, a, on a pod on the, on the Cessna Strout. You can see here a picture. This is from the island of Guam. Guam was in the news lately, so we've mapped the entire island. And in Guam, there are any, there are any collection aircraft. So if you want to collect in Guam, you have to find either to get one from the mainland or from Japan or to find a local aircraft. So with our, with our capabilities, we can just find a local Cessna, install the pod, and be ready for 3D collection. So this is done for the entire island of Guam. This is an example of how the system looks when it sweeps. You can see the camera moves from right to left, stops and takes image, stops and takes an image, uh, rotating a, a medium format 100 megapixel camera. Now this still requires us to fly. No, no, okay, I know. This, this, really, this also requires us to fly both directions if you want to get 3D model with one camera sweeping. It gives us only the life re left of and right from one direction, so we have to fly both directions. But this is the reason we have developed this system, which has two phase one sweeping camera systems, both 100 megapixel, one looking 90 degree nadir and one looking 45 degrees forward. And this allows us, this allows us uh, also to um, have a full 3D from one flight pass. This is also patent pending in the US, this, uh, this system. Um, so we actually get more than nine views every, on each object. How does it happen? So basically the forward uh, camera takes the, the one and two, three, the three forward images, and then the nadir camera takes these three over here. And when the plane goes to the other direction, we collect the other six. But because we have a lot of overlap between the lines, over here, we get the full nine views, and even more, actually, we, get, we see each object from 40 or 50 images, and that really makes a difference afterwards when you, um, when you do the, the mesh pro automatic processing. So this is uh, an example of how, a, how one of our sweep looks on the ground, the footprint. Uh, so you can see the overlap between the sweep is 12%. That's all we need. 60% uh, forward, and we usually fly for our, uh, for 3D, 80% side overlap. Um, the swap on the ground is roughly 1,500 meters. This is from three centimeters resolution. Um, but it still gets a decent collection rate because we, with one camera system, we can get roughly 10 square kilometers an hour collected in three centimeters. So a city like Tel Aviv, which is maybe 50 square kilometers, can be collected in five to six hours. With the two camera system, we can actually get almost double that, so around 20 square kilometers in three centimeters per hour. Uh, this is how a sweep looks at 10 centimeters, and you can see the large swath, uh, five kilometers, 55,000 meters across track. So this is comparable, even bigger than some of the largest uh, systems available today. Field of view is also a big factor, 110 degrees, that also help us to get good angles that the uh, mesh software then can later process a good 3D model. So 3D mesh processing is actually a very important part of all of the production. Uh, and, and by that, one of the things we are doing differently is we're not using one software for the entire procedure. So we do all of the AT work, the matching and AT using our own models, and only, only use software um, as Bentley and Photomash and the textured software is just at the final DSM extraction and texturing. So all of the AT is done before that, and that really helped us to speed up the rate of processing and the accuracies. So these are the main 3D agents. Now, it's not listed uh, uh, by importance, but how we use them currently. So maybe after this conference, this is going to change. But currently, uh, 3D mesh engines, we use both Bentley and Skyland Photomesh. Uh, and for the viewers, we have the Skyland Terra Explorer, which is one of the leading, um, leading local viewers, and also web, uh, and, and for web viewers, there is Cesium, 
which I, I'm sure you all heard of, that's an open source that everyone is now talking about, that we also in Simplex develop on top of it applications so we can, um, develop, uh, we can distribute the data to many users. So there are a lot of other companies using, uh, working on this Serena, and you can see Eternix also from Israel, um, some German companies, and from all over Europe. Esri, of course, also trying to be part of this market, now it's trying to catch up with the ability to uh, present 3D data as good as the other softwares. Um, 3D GIS, so basically what that means is 3D model is not enough. I mean, it looks nice, but it doesn't have the added value. So in order to have the added value, we need to connect it with existing data layers, and we need to distribute the data. And the idea is to basically, we believe that in a few years we will replace all 2D maps with 3D maps, specific and realistic models. Um, some of the applications that we've been working with the last year, a couple of years, so smart cities, urban planning, uh, a lot of defense and security. Actually, 3D models are, really opens the market. It really um, allows a lot of industries to make new uses of 3D and geospatial data. So let, let me show you a couple of examples real quick of how 3D examples are looking. Sorry about the delay, that was ready already, but because of... Okay, so what we will see here is uh, the city of Natania. The city of Natania was all modeled, 45 square kilometers, 3 centimeters. This has now been operating by various uh, sectors in the, in the city. And one of the first uses is urban planning, where you can actually uh, plant new plans of buildings, 3D models, SketchUp or any other inside the city and have a scientific tool that can really show you accurately how a new building would look like in the in the neighborhood and of course you can measure and you have first uh, various applications like shadow analysis uh, view shed line of sight you can actually show the people in the buildings exactly what they expected to see from their floor uh, so real estate are really interesting about these models um, the committees that approve the projects are now starting to use these models rather than just 2D maps. Um, so urban use, it's uh, urban planning and urban use, that's one of the first users of 3D mesh. Let's have a look at the, and of course you can see here integration of data layers. So every data layer, every 2D data layer that the city has in their GIS system can be also integrated on the 3D model and being, we can search on these layers and integrate them seamlessly. Let's look at another application, this time more, more security related. So this is the, in Haifa, this is the stadium of Sami Ofer. It's one of the largest football stadium in Israel. And here we've been uh, lay out all of the um, security plans for games that happened during this season. So you can actually see that we can um, um, put people and fences and traffic control and everything that could be done on that model. And what's interesting in this one, on this model is that we also model the interior of the stadium, not just the outside. This was done with a, with a drone. Uh, we flew a drone inside the stadium. So even the stands the, of the crowd are modeled in 3D and you can position the guards and you can simulate different scenarios on top of the 3D model. So let's see one scenario, for example, that can train this, the forces. So here we can see like an example of a crowd gathering outside the stadium and then some terror, terror attack of a truck driving into the crowd and we can see which cameras see, see this truck while it goes and when it stops near the crowd and then we can see how the, the forces around it will react and actually if we have forces that broadcast GPS layer we can actually integrate dynamic layers and we can see how the forces react 
the, the dis dispatch forces and everything are, is, is happening in real time. So even though it's more of a planning module, it's also possible to use it in, in command and control um, units. And we've done that also in the security of sports events and other events. So you can see here where you see the teams arriving to the scene. And if you have GPS on every one of these teams, you can have it, uh, you can see it on real, real time. So let's go back now to finish the presentation. So um, this is us in the Command and Control Center in Jerusalem Police, where we also integrated 3D model of Jerusalem. We didn't have the time uh, to, to show you Jerusalem in three centimeters that we also have here. Um, another thing I want to show you is for dynamic layers integration is integration between few sources of data, all built on the 3D model. This was done with a company we worked with called Synergy, uh, also an Israeli company. So here we can see on the right, we can see like a video coming from a drone and video and cameras that are positioning the, uh, the cars and forces on the 3D model and we can um, track them in real time, track the GPS coordinates. You see on the right, all the forces in this simulation. And of course we can see a simulation of things happening, we'll see uh, an explosion in a second, and, and all of that integration is possible based on a 3D model, uh, which is also a new approach. So just to conclude what, we, what I've said so far, um, yeah, so we think that mesh maps and 3D GIS would be definitely the, infra the infrastructure of the near future, not in the long future. Um, we think that, you know, very soon, if you would look at a 2D map, it would look to you, uh, it would look to you old and not intuitive, almost like today when, you, when someone is, is talking next to you with a regular phone and not a smartphone. Um, so I think the revolution has started and I think that after the presentation Victor gave and Seeing that, I think we can all also agree that the revolution already started uh, today. Um, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Avi. Uh, we are short on time, so unless there is one question. Yes, please. Uh, yes, please. <coughs> but the infrastructure is, most of the infrastructure people are looking for vectorization. I didn't see the vectorization part within the mesh collection. I, I lost, I didn't hear the, the last part, the what? Most of the infrastructure designers are looking for such a uh, tool, but also they need the vectorization and measurements of the... Yes, yeah, so of course everything is measurable here because this is a map. This is a... W very can, accurate map. Can you convert it to CAD, for example? And uh, there are tools for different different softwares, like uh, um, like Bentley has some tools for that. And the infra I mean, f the, the the connection with the infrastructure can be done. It's all there are already tools out there today, like Bentley Descartes, for example, that are can, can do the integration between the CAD formats and the 3D mesh. Uh, we're just showing you in the meantime. I know some of you are going to visit Jerusalem on Thursday, so a, a quick peek on how Jerusalem looks in three centimeter resolution, uh, some of the nice places. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Avi. Thank you, all the other three. Yes, of course, all the other three presenters.